Hi there. Welcome to lecture 7.3, which is entitled Orders Perissodactyla and Set Artiodactyla. So today I'll be discussing the ungulates, the hooved animals, in the order Perissodactyla, which are the odd-toed ungulates, like the Cape Mountain zebra here on the top left, which is in the family Equidae. I'll discuss the rhinoceroses, like the black rhino here. And then we'll move on to the set artiodactyla, the even-toed ungulates, like the Bactrin camel, that's the one with two humps on the top right. We'll discuss one of the most spectacular migrations on the planet, the porcupine caribou. And you can see he's rubbed his velvet off his antlers here on the bottom left. Um, the caribou reindeer are in the family Cervidae, the deer family. We'll discuss the African antelopes that are in the family Bovidae, like the greater kudu here. Uh, we'll end with the hippopotamus. There's two species of hippopotamus, and I'll, I'll show you some adorable photos of a newborn uh, baby pygmy hippo from the San Diego Zoo. And then, wait, what's this? A breaching humpback whale? <laughs> That's right. So the cetaceans, the whales and dolphins, are now included in the set Artiodactyla. So when I was a mammalogy student, it was just the Artiodactyla set here from cetacean. Uh, so they've combined them into uh, this order. That said, uh, we're not going to cover the infraorder cetacea in this lecture. I'm gonna save that for your final lecture in ABS 470. All right, so the orders Perissodactyla and Set Artiodactyla, which is the Artiodactyla and the Cetaceans, uh, these are two closely related orders. Um, these orders are going to share the most recent common ancestor, according to both Meredith as well as Springer. You can see, got them lumped together here as well. And these are our final two orders in ABS 470, and they're also the last two orders in this super order that we've been working on uh, for the past couple of weeks, the Lar Asia Theria. Hopefully that rings a bell by now. All right, the perissodactyls and the set artiodactyls include the modern ungulates. And as I mentioned at the outset, that historically encompassed all of the hooved, terrestrial herbivores. The smaller of the two orders, the Perissodactyla, includes the odd-toed ungulates. There's just three families. The first are the horses, asses, which are the donkeys, and the zebras in the family Equidae. The second is the tapirs in the Tapiridae. And then the third and the final is the critically endangered rhinoceroses. The second order, the set artiodactyla, is quite a bit larger. It's going to include 10 terrestrial families of even-toed ungulates, including the camels, the pigs in the family Suidae, the peccaries, like the collared peccary, which you may know as the javelina that lives right here in the Sonoran Desert. They're in the Teasuidae the mouse deer, the giraffes, the hippopotamuses, the pronghorn antelope, which is another denizen of the Sonoran Desert. They're in their own family, the Antilocapridae. The musk deer, the deer family itself, known as the Cervidae, definitely a family you should know. And then the very large Bovidae, definitely a family that you should know, which, in, which includes all of those African antelopes, as well as cattle, sheep, and goats. All right, just to reiterate, whales like this beluga whale are included within the order set artiodactyla. Specifically, they're in a suborder with the hippos. And the name of the suborder is the whippomorpha. 
You can see what they did there. They took whales and hippo and made whippomorpha. So I know that lumping hippos and whales and dolphins may not be intuitively obvious, um, but I'm gonna show you hippos at the very end and I've got one slide in particular and it's a hippo walking under the water, just so at ease, completely submerged. They can be submerged for like 30 minutes, very comfortable in the water. It's not that far of a stretch to see some ancestor of cetaceans and hippos, some whippomorph, right, uh, that is definitely semi-aquatic and then splits into the lineage that is to become the hippopotamuses and all of the cetaceans filling all of those uh, marine niches. So that said, there is overwhelming evidence for this phylogenetic arrangement, including very strong molecular evidence. There's dental similarities between the set artiodactyls and the cetaceans, the even-toed ungulates and the cetaceans. And then there's also paleontological and skeletal data. And by that, I specifically mean parazonic feet and a double pulley bone called the astragalus, which is in terrestrial set artiodactyls, and I'll show you that bone here in just a second, and it's also present in early cetaceans that are making their way to that fully aquatic lifestyle. However, because the morphology and the life history characteristics of modern ungulates and whales is so radically different, herein I'm going to cover terrestrial ungulates. And then in my final lecture, 7.4, I'll cover the cetaceans. Deal? The unifying characteristic of ungulates is truly their limb structure. So both perissodactyls and terrestrial set artiodactyls, they're going to walk on the tips of their toes, which end in this thick, hard, keratinized, and by that I mean composed of the protein keratin, hooves. Okay, like you can see here in this horse. Okay, further ungulates have reduced toes across the board. These are the odd toed ungulates. Here's the even toed ungulates on the bottom. Uh, let's see, F is a camel, G is a pronghorn. The other thing is they have a lengthened foot. And then they have this bone, the heel bone, the calcaneum, which is in gray, is way up here. It doesn't articulate with the fibula. Instead, it articulates with this bone, the astragalus, okay? So that's the bone that's present on those ancient uh, whale-like uh, fossils. So what this arrangement is going to do is it's going to restrict uh, the ungulate limbs, uh, the movement into a single plane, which is going to make them very fast because ungulates have evolved for cursorial or running locomotion. The perissodactyls, the odd-toed ungulates, like this Malayan tapir, and it's really striking uh, striped calf here, Today, they're the smaller order in terms of the number of extant species. As I mentioned, they're really a remnant of a group that flourished during the early to mid tertiary period in contrast to the modern terrestrial set artiodactyls, the even-toed ungulates, again exclusive of the whales, which encompasses today a really diverse array of species. So we'll begin with the perissodactyla. Uh, all perissodactyls, like the Przewalski's horse here, the Mongolian name is the Taki, uh, they're all large terrestrial herbivores. Recall that these are hind gut fermenters, meaning they don't ruminate, they're not going to chew their cud, and so hind gut fermenters are going to feed on fibrous vegetation that's often of very poor quality, but they can process it relatively fast and eat lots of it. 
Hopefully you remember the strategy between the hindgut and the foregut fermenters. The family Equidae contains between seven and nine species, all in the genus Equus. Their natural distribution includes Eastern Africa and from the Middle East to Mongolia. Extant equids include the African wild ass, the Przewalski's horse, which I showed you on the last slide, the Asiatic wild ass, the Kayang, and three species of zebras, including the uh, gravy zebra, shown here, the plains zebra, and the mountain zebra. And then the sometimes uh, feral horse, as well as the domestic horse, and the donkey or the ass. So equids inhabit short grasslands and desert scrublands and are never far from water. Their basic social unit is a family group, generally consisting of 10 to 15 individuals, including a highly territorial male, several females, and their offspring in the herd. In the Western United States, as of the 1st of March 2018, and I'm citing your book, there were almost 82,000 free-ranging wild feral horses on public lands, up from just 25,000 in 1971. These feral horses are descendant from the domestic horses that the Spaniards brought to the New World uh, several hundred years ago. So they're now managed by the Bureau of Land Management, the BLM, under the Wild and Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act of 1971. So although many are adopted each year, some 245,000 at the start of the program, which is pretty remarkable, and others are rounded up and shipped off to private ranches and other parts of the country, it's still been difficult to keep the number of feral horses at the mandated level of approximately 27,000 horses. The only alternatives to shooting horses, which is not very palatable with the public, are extensive immunocontraceptive programs to reduce foaling rates. And I have to show you this footage. So this is really cool footage from a nonprofit that is successfully using immunocontraceptives to control feral horses that are foaling right here on the Salt River. Please watch this. It is so good. The video is so good. Um, but there's really nice footage of them using a dart gun um, and administering the contraceptive. It's just like I used to do many years ago with black-tailed deer, except we were giving them ketamine to put on uh, radio collars um, that's really exciting to see and it also what's so cool is it seems to be working as they have dramatically curtailed the number of new foals so if you're interested in, in feral horses um, and their management controlling their populations so populations don't become too dense and we don't have uh, habitat degradation and mass starvation um, check this video out the four species of tapirs in the family Tapiridae have a discontinuous geographic distribution. And hopefully you remember what that means. There's big gaps between where these different species are found. So uh, species include the South American or lowland tapir and the mountain tapir, both of which occur in northern South America. The Baird's Tapir, shown here, which is in Mexico, Central America, and Northern South America. And then the Malayan Tapir, all the way over in Southeast Asia, and Myanmar, Thailand, um, Malaysia, and Sumatra. So tapirs are going to inhabit heavily forested areas, rainforests often, where they feed on the understory shoots, twigs, fruit, grasses, aquatic vegetation. Uh, many of them will, will get into uh, bodies of water and occasionally cultivated crops. Um, they're also known to be significant seed dispersers, so probably important in structuring uh, tropical forest communities. The mountain tapir, the Baird's tapir, and the Malayan tapir are all endangered, and the South American tapir is threatened. 
So populations of tapirs are slow to recover because of very low reproductive rates. So they have slow tempos. They only have one young at a time and their gestation length is 395 days. All right, the rhino ser today. Uh, the rhinoceroses. There are four genera in this family. Historically, there were five living species that were recognized. Both the white and the black rhinos occur in sub-Saharan, Central, and East Africa. The Indian rhino occurred past tense. In Pakistan and northern India, the Javan rhino was originally in southeastern Asia from eastern India to Vietnam, Sumatra, and Java. The Sumatran rhino was originally distributed throughout southeastern Asia, including Sumatra and Borneo. The family name means nose horn in Greek. It's fitting. Um, but these guys are unique in having no bony core or keratinized sheath. But instead, that horn is made of a dermal mass of keratinized fibers. It's essentially fused hairs. But it's the same protein that you and I's hair is made out of. And that's what they're being butchered for. So the geographic range of all species is confined to tropical and subtropical habitats, but it's been greatly reduced due to human interference, poaching, and habitat destruction. Populations of all species have declined drastically during the past 150 years. As is the case with most large mammals like the tapirs, they have low reproductive rates. And so it takes a while for them to mitigate uh, these losses to recover when populations have been reduced. The black, Javan, Sumatran rhinos are all critically endangered, while the two Asian species are near extinction. Rhinos are poached for their horns which along with other body parts are valued in traditional Asian medicine for supposed aphrodisiac and medicinal properties. Further, the horns have also been traditionally used for making dagger handles in Yemen and other countries in the Middle East. Um, so this is a grave of Sudan. He was the last male northern white rhino who died a few years ago in 2018. There's some really moving pictures that came out making this species functionally extinct. Um, I want you to watch this video. It's only six minutes, um, but it's going to show you the last two remaining female northern white rhinos and efforts to use their eggs and frozen sperm to do in vitro fertilization in a last ditch effort uh, to bring back the northern white rhinoceros. All right, moving on to the even-toed ungulates, the order Set Artiodactyla. So compared to the Perissodactyls, terrestrial Set Artiodactyls are much more selective feeders, like the Maasai giraffe shown here which is a factor in their greater adaptive radiation. There's a lot more species uh, that are extant today. So in contrast to the just three families and approximately 18 species of perissodactyls, terrestrial set artiodactyls include 10 living families and up to 550 species that are distributed almost worldwide, either naturally or through introduction. The four suborders that are now recognized include the suborder Suina, generally considered the least derived, the most primitive group, which includes two families, the Suidae, the pigs, the warthogs, and the Teasuidae, the peccaries. The suborder Tylopoda, which includes the single family, the camels, uh, the Camillidae, which is the camels, the llamas, and the vacuna. Six extant families make up the suborder Ruminatia, the most derived group, the Tragulidae, the chevrotains or the mouse deer, the giraffes, the cervidae, the moshidae, the antilocapridae, and the bovidae. 
And then the suborder Ripomorpha, which I've talked about, includes the hippopotamuses as well as the toothed whales, the parv order Odontoceti, and the baleen whales, the parv order Mystoceti, which we'll talk about next lecture. Camels are distinct from other terrestrial set artiodactyls, and they're the sole living members of this suborder, the Tylopoda, which is Greek for pad-footed. There are three genera and six species that differ greatly in size. So some authorities consider the few remaining wild Bactrian camels to be a separate species from the domesticated Bactrian camels. And then we have the guanaco, which is the wild ancestor shown here of domesticated llamas. And then the vacuna is the wild ancestor of the domesticated alpaca. Head and body length in the one-humped or the dromedary camels shown here, as well as the two-humped, the Bactrian camel, can approach three and a half meters and a body mass of close to 700 kilograms, right? So that's over 1,500 pounds. The dromedary camel may have once ranged throughout the Middle East, but now survives only in domestication, except for, of all places, the Australian outback. So that's where the wild dromedary camels are left now on planet Earth. So around 20,000 camels were imported to Australia in the late 1800s. They went feral, they colonized the outback, and now there are over a million feral camels in the outback. The Bactrian camel originally ranged throughout much of Central Asia, um, but it's now restricted in the wild to just the western Gobi Desert. Guanacos are found from sea level all the way up to 4,000 meters high in the Andes Mountains from southern Peru to Tierra del Fuego. And then the smaller bodied uh, vacunas occur in the grasslands of Peru, western Bolivia, northeast Chile, and northwestern Argentina, also at high elevations from 3,700 to 4,800 meters. All camelids are gregarious, meaning they're social, diurnal, active during the day, and herbivorous, and they're best suited to dry, arid environments. They're able to eat plants with a high salt content that are simply not tolerated by other grazers. They're well known for their ability to go great distances under very difficult conditions, capable of conserving water much better than other large mammals. Camels, get this, may lose 40% of their body mass, 40% of their body mass through desiccation without harm. That's pretty remarkable. When camels are well fed, their humps are firm and erect. So those humps, they're, they're not bags of water, they're fat reservoirs. Each one can weigh over 75 pounds. Uh, but as they burn through that fat, it's going to shrink and then eventually that hump will actually lean to one side when the camels become nutritionally stressed. The family Suidae is comprised of six genera and between 17 to 20 species of pigs. Pigs, as we know, are omnivores. They have generalized dentition and simple stomachs. Their cheek teeth are brachiodont and bunodont, just like ours, and they have large, ever-growing canines. The upper pair of canines are going to curve upwards and outwards to form tusks. Pig habitats include tropical forests, woodlands, scrubby thickets, grasslands, savannas, and deserts. Regardless of habitats, pigs are always closely associated with mud wallows, which are really important for them for cooling down, for thermal regulation, as well as for protecting themselves against biting insects and reducing ectoparasite loads. The native distribution of the suids, the pigs, is Europe 
Africa, except for the Saharan Desert, and Asia, including Indonesia, Borneo, and the Philippines. That said, pigs have certainly been introduced to both North and South America, as well as Australia and New Zealand, where both feral and domestic pigs now flourish. Further, there's an estimated 1 billion domestic pigs worldwide, and they obviously provide a significant source of animal protein for Homo sapiens. Although I do have to say that the industrialized pork industry is pretty cruel. I don't know if you've ever seen video, um, but pigs that are raised for pork spend their entire lives in crates so small that they can't even turn around. The family Tyasuidae contains three genera of peccaries each with a single species which superficially resemble pigs. The tusk-like upper canines of peccaries, which are up to 40 centimeters in length, are sharp-edged and they're going to point downward, unlike those of pigs which curl upwards. Also, peccaries are only found in the New World, from the southwestern United States all the way down to central Argentina, where they occur in various habitats from desert scrublands, like here in the Sonoran Desert, to tropical rainforests. Peccaries are primarily diurnal herbivores. Like suids, they are non-ruminating. They do root with their snouts as pigs do, but occasionally they're going to take small vertebrates, invertebrates, insects, arthropods, eggs, fruit, and carrion. So living in Arizona, you should be familiar with the collared peccary or the javelina. So please take the one minute and 40 seconds and check out this footage of the javelina enjoying some prickly pear. The family Tragulidae includes three genera and ten species of water chevrotains and mouse deer. So this species just blows me away. There are six species of mouse deer, like the Javan mouse deer shown here, which occur in Southeast Asia. And then there's three species of spotted chevrotains, which are in India and Sri Lanka. So whereas the water chevrotain occurs in tropical regions of West Central Africa. So the, this species here, the Javan mouse deer, is the world's smallest set artiodactyl. It's the size of a rabbit. So they weigh just over two pounds, and yet they resemble this tiny, chunky little deer with these skinny legs, the Javan mouse deer. So unlike deer, male chevrotans have no antlers and no facial or other body glands. So as in species without antlers, the tragulids have an enlarged, curved upper canine that extends beyond the upper lip. It's shown here. They also have a four-chambered ruminating stomach, although the third chamber, the omasum, hopefully you remember that, is very poorly developed. Historically, this family was considered to have only two living species, the unmistakable giraffe, the namesake of the family, and then the less familiar okapi, which is pictured here, which is a giraffe that's adapted for the dense rainforests of the Congo. Currently, however, four species of giraffe are generally recognized, the northern giraffe, the southern giraffe, the reticulated giraffe, and the Maasai giraffe. So giraffes are patchily distributed in savannas, grasslands, and open woodlands north and south throughout sub-Saharan Africa in areas that are often associated with acacia trees. Here's a quick look at those four species, the northern giraffe on the far left, the southern on the far right, the Maasai has some really striking uh, splotches here, and then the reticulated one with larger spot splotches that are a little bit ruddy colored. Giraffes, of course, are known for their long legs and their long necks, which allow them to access forage like acacia leaves that are out of reach for other large herbivores. 
the height in giraffes is attained by elongation of the leg bones as well as the neck bones Although, as in most mammals, giraffes have the normal number of seven cervical vertebrae. So they don't have more vertebrae. Their vertebrae are just larger and longer. In male giraffes, the top of the head can be six meters from the ground, which is 20 feet uh, from the ground. Um, they, males can reach over 4,000 pounds. Even though the relative size of the heart in the giraffe is about the same as in other mammals, it's about 0.5% of the giraffe's body weight, they do have the highest blood pressure of any mammal, and that's to get that blood all the way up that long neck against the pull of gravity uh, to oxygenate that very expensive brain. It's a really nice clip here discussing the anatomical and the physiological challenges that giraffes have just getting a drink out of the water hole. So take the two minutes and check this out, please. The family Antilocapridae is a monotypic family that includes only the pronghorn antelope which is endemic to the open grasslands and the arid regions of our western North America. The pronghorn is the fastest new world mammal. So hunters that I used to uh, know at Utah State University referred to them as speed goats. That speed reflects their evolution as North American grassland specialists that are adapted to outrun speedy predators. What speedy predators were they outrunning? The American cheetah. Yes, North America had cheetahs. They were widely distributed and they only went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene some 12,000 years ago. The pronghorn speed results from their long legs, their long stride, and their relatively large heart and lungs. Very powerful cardiovascular systems. They can attain speeds of 100 kilometers per hour. That's 60 miles per hour for short distances. Pronghorns forage on grasses, forbs, and low shrubs, especially sagebrush. So they can eat that pungent sagebrush. This is the Sonoran pronghorn antelope. It's a subspecies that you need to be aware of. So this is definitely five minutes well spent. It's a really nice synopsis given to you by the director of the Sonoran pronghorn recovery effort with the US Fish and Wildlife Service. She's going to talk about the current status of Sonoran pronghorn, this endangered subspecies, and really give you a window into what it's like working with US Fish and Wildlife on a recovery effort. The other thing I would add is there is opportunity with this project. So several years back now, um, I had a former student uh, who was able to get a full-time position with Arizona Game and Fish at the state level working on uh, pronghorn recovery on the captive breeding uh, effort uh, down in Ajo. Moving on to the family Moshidae, it's composed of seven species of musk deer, like this Siberian musk deer that's also called the vampire deer. So surprisingly, this family is actually more closely related to the Bovidae, uh, which we'll cover here shortly, than the Cervidae, based on both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. Musk deer are known for and named for uh, this musk gland uh, or pod that develops slightly anterior to the genital area of males and it's released, the pheromones are released in the urine. It's important during the breeding season for marking territory and attracting females. All right, we've made it. The deer family, the Cervidae, is a large family comprised of 18 genera and approximately 52 extant species that are widely distributed, absent only from Sub-Saharan Africa, that's Bovidae country, and Antarctica. 
They're not native to Australia or New Zealand, but cervids have definitely been introduced there. Habitats occupied by deer include deciduous forests, marshes, grasslands, tundra, scrublands, mountains, and rainforests. So very adaptable family. Deer range in size from the northern Pudu with a maximum body mass of only six kilograms all the way up to the massive and uh, semi-aquatic moose weighing in at over 800 kilograms. I'll never forget when I saw my first moose in Yellowstone National Park, um, very much at home in a pond. So deer, as you well know, exhibit sexual dimorphism with males. Male deer are often called bucks or bulls or stags when you're talking about red deer. The males are often about 25% larger in body mass and body dimensions than females, which are sometimes called does, as we call our whitetail and mule deer here, cows like our elk, and hinds, and that's uh, what we call female red deer over in Europe. Cervids, of course, are known for their antlers, which usually occur only in males, with exceptions being the Chinese water deer, in which males don't have antlers at all, and then the caribou, or the reindeer, in which both sexes, both males and female caribou, sport antlers. It's important to note that those antlers in caribou function to remove snow during those long dark winters so that caribou can access forage. So that's natural selection at work. Those antlers are increasing the probability of survival for both males and females. Antlers are different from horns. Antlers are deciduous. That is to say, they're shed each winter following the rut, following the breeding season, and then they're regrown uh, beginning the following spring. Growing antlers are covered with this haired, highly vascularized skin known as velvet shown here. Uh, so elk and deer, they're going to rub off that velvet on usually on rub trees uh, right before the rut. It's a good way to uh, think about where the elk can be found by looking for rub trees. Antlers are going to grow very fast, up to 2.5 centimeters per day in large species, and they're able to do this because they can temporarily draw minerals from the axial skeleton, from the main skeleton in the body, and divert that calcium to their growing antlers. Antler size, uh, as well as the number of tines or points, are a function of nutritional condition genetic factors as well as age. And as we discussed in our last lecture on sexual selection, um, they're an indicator of underlying male fitness. So sexual selection is certainly operating on these monstrosities. All right, so for your module seven assignment, you're going to watch an absolutely stunning movie called Serengeti nature's living laboratory. So it's going to discuss population regulation of wildebeest, a keystone species in the Serengeti that has evolved this epic migration chasing rains to its calving grounds to really maximize the probability of calf survival. So this is a sweeping film. It's beautifully done and it's going to transport you for an hour to the Serengeti. And a lot of the work that they did here is comparable to the case study that I've already presented to you on elk calf survival. So really nice tie in here. The largest family of set artiodactyls is the family Bovidae, and it's going to include 54 genera and as many as 297 species. That's almost double the number of recognized species just 20 years ago, and that's thanks to ongoing molecular research that is recognizing that many of these populations, which were formerly under the umbrella of one species, haven't exchanged genetic information 
information for hundreds of thousands if not millions of years. All bovids, as we've discussed, have four chambered ruminating stomachs, so they are four gut fermenters. Size in bovids varies greatly from the royal antelope with a maximum body mass of just 1.5 kilograms all the way up to cattle in the genus Boss and elands uh, like you see here which can have body masses approaching a thousand kilograms, 2200 pounds. All bovids have a pair of horns with the exception of the four-horned antelope or the chausinga, which has both anterior and posterior pairs of horns. Bovid horns are present on both males and some females. Horns are different from antlers. They have a bony core, which is an extension of the frontal bone in the skull, and then horns are covered with a keratinized sheath. Horns can be straight, they can be spiraled, they can be curved, and horns are going to grow throughout an individual's life. They're not shed like antlers, they continually grow as the bovid ages. Variation in the size and the shape of these horns reflects the fighting behavior of the species. Important to note, if a horn breaks, while species are fighting, then it's not going to regrow. All right, some of the different horns that we see in bovids. Number one, the Jemsbach. Number two, the Attix. Uh, number three is the Transcaspian Uriel. Uh, so this is in the same genus, Ovis, as our bighorn sheep. Uh, Kirk's Dick Dick. A uh, tiny little ungulate with tiny little horns. Uh, let's see, number five, that's a wildebeest. That's an eastern white-bearded wildebeest. Number six is an eland, and I showed you a picture of one of those already. Seven, an alpine ibex. Okay, so we're living way up in the high country. Eight is a gazelle. This is the northern Grant's gazelle, favorite prey of cheetah. Uh, a mountain goat, great place to go and see mountain goats is in Glacier National Park. We have a hartebeest, number 10, a red hartebeest. Number 11 is a water buck. Number 12 is the four-horned antelope that I mentioned at the beginning of this slide. Let's see, 13 is a duke here, and then we have one of Africa's big five here on the bottom right, the Cape Buffalo, which is quite dangerous, uh, quite irascible, um, known for their bad tempers. So wild bovids are naturally absent only from South America and Australia. However, domesticated bovids have now been introduced worldwide. So wild species of bovids are found primarily in Africa and Eurasia, where they occupy grasslands, savannas, scrublands, and forests. Bovids also occur in harsher environments, including tundra, deserts, and swamplands. Okay, so that uh, high country uh, ibex that I showed you, as well as those mountain goats, they're gonna be way up uh, in the high country in tundra biomes. Cattle, Sheep, goats have been domesticated for over 5,000 years. And as you well know, they're an integral part of agricultural economies all throughout the world, including the Maasai, um, as shown here. Uh, the Maasai have been uh, raising cattle, uh, both dairying and um, slaughtering cows for thousands of years. And finally, the last suborder in the set Artiodactyla, the whimsical whippomorpha, which combines whale and hippo uh, to form the suborder, which reflects this association between the hippopotamuses and their close relatives, the cetaceans, the dolphins and whales. 
the two extant species of hippos do differ greatly in size. So you're probably familiar with the common hippopotamus. It has a total length of up to five and a half meters and a maximum body mass of 4,500 kilograms, which is almost 10,000 pounds. Meanwhile, the pygmy hippo shown here has a total length of just two meters and a maximum body mass of just, just 270 kilograms or about 600 pounds. So the pygmy hippo is endangered. This is a baby here that was born in the San Diego Zoo, a beautiful zoo uh, in 2020. Baby pygmy hippo. So without temperature regulating sweat glands and that massive body size, both species of hippos have glandular skin that's going to exude a pigmented fluid that appears red and gives rise to this misconception that hippos are sweating blood. It's not actually blood, it's a fluid uh, that has evolved to protect their skin from sunburn because hippos are nearly hairless. It also acts as an antibiotic to keep wounds from becoming infected. As I mentioned at the beginning, hippos are clearly very adept in the water. The common hippopotamus can remain submerged like this for 30 minutes while walking along the bottom of lakes and rivers just feeding on plants. And of course, these hippos share a common ancestor with a lineage that splits off and becomes fully aquatic. The dolphins and the whales, the cetaceans, which I'll discuss in our final lecture. As always, references for your slides are here, and I will see you next time for the last installment of ABS 470. Thanks so much for listening. Cheers.